Renee Davies is a recent graduate of Queen's University and has returned to the Ottawa Riverkeeper team after having spent a previous summer as the communications intern. Renee now fills the role of outreach and volunteer coordinator and likes connecting with volunteers and enthusiasts of healthy water. She grew up along the water and learned to sail from a young age. In fact, she competed here in competitions at NSC. So she's inspiring an appreciation for healthy water's edge. Spending her summers out on the Gatineau and Ottawa rivers, Renee had the opportunity to visit, compete and coach in various amazing locations, she says. Ottawa Riverkeeper, as you may know, is an independent voice for the Ottawa River, working to protect, promote and improve the health of the Ottawa River and its tributaries. We at NSC highly value Ottawa Riverkeeper as an important partner of the Nepean Sailing, Nepean Sailing Club. We look forward to learning lots about the Ottawa River watershed and how we can contribute to caring for this incredible resource to help protect our watershed and make the Ottawa River a swimmable, drinkable and fishable river. Now, Renee will speak in a moment and she'll be happy to take questions throughout her talk. You can wait till the end, but you can also uh, raise your hand or even just get up and walk to the floor mic. And I ask you to please do that. Ask your question from the floor mic so our friends at home can also hear what you're asking. And uh, likewise, if you're viewing on YouTube, please use the chat function at any time and I'll be happy to pass the questions on right here in the room. All right, Renee, thank you. So I work for Ottawa Riverkeeper. Uh, we are a charity, environmental charity, that works towards the better water health all over the watershed. Okay, um, so I'll talk a little bit about us and also what a Riverkeeper is. We actually are part of the Riverkeeper Alliance, which is an international alliance, and we work a little bit differently than probably most places do. Uh, we actually work across jurisdictions. So we work in both Ontario and Quebec because that's how our watershed is formed. Um, we are completely science-based. So we have an amazing science team that helps us do research. They collect data throughout the entire watershed and they also allow us to bring our information and the content to the public. Uh, we are collaborative and we really try to work with anyone who will have us. Um, it's really important for us that we actually bridge the gap between different organizations, whether they're at the federal level, provincial level, municipal level. A lot of times they don't actually share resources with one another. And so if we can be that bridge between them, we would love to. So the Waterkeeper Alliance is actually an international alliance. Um, it, the goal is to preserve and protect water bodies, but we all have the goal of having swimmable, fishable, and drinkable waterways. Um, it connects over 2.69 million square miles of watershed, and we unite over 300 waterkeeper organizations all over. Um, there's quite a few of them in the US, um, and we actually have one of the biggest watersheds that's represented in the Alliance in Canada. So a bit about our story. We are a grassroots charity that was founded in 2001. So we are not very old. Um, we have lots of supporters that come to us as the go-to organization for their questions, but also if they have any concerns of pollution in the um, watershed, they generally come to us to find out what's going on and what they can do about it. Um, it actually started with one part-time position and we now have 15 full-time positions. So we've grown quite a bit in the last 22 years, I guess you could say now. Um, and our current river keeper is Laura. So this is a map of the Ottawa River watershed. It's a quite a big watershed, so it doesn't quite do it justice. Um, it's actually twice the size of New Brunswick. So just to give you an idea of the land mass that it covers, 
One third of it is in Ontario and two thirds of it is actually in Quebec. And as you can see, the Ottawa River spans a huge part of that area. And it's a lot bigger than most people would actually realize, um, especially since it kind of goes around in a big sea. So not a lot of people realize just exactly where the river starts. So if you take a look at the exterior outline, it shows you the boundaries of the watershed. And we always want to talk about the links that we have to the indigenous population, um, because there's actually quite a big correlation between the watershed outline and the Algonquin territory. So as you can see in the overlay, it's actually quite closely knit. And it's really important to understand how much the Ottawa River had an impact and affected the way that they lived. It was incredibly important for trade and travel, um, but it really just does show you how much, um, for us, the Ottawa River acts as a provincial boundary, but in other cases, it doesn't necessarily have to be the separation of land that's focused on. As you may know, the Ottawa River flows into the St. Lawrence River in Montreal, um, and we are the largest tributary to the St. Lawrence River. And we also have many, many watersheds within our own. So for example, the Gatineau River has its own watershed, which is within our watershed. So what is a watershed, you may be asking yourself. It's an area that's determined by boundaries of elevated peaks. So if you think about it, you can drop a drop of water anywhere in the watershed and it will gradually make its way into the Ottawa River. Um, so no matter how north it is in the watershed, it will gradually flow through. And you always want to think of the small, smaller bodies of water that you may not realize have an impact, like streams and creeks that seem so small in the beginning, but that flow rate will actually make itself into the Ottawa River afterwards. Um, as water flows through the watershed, it picks up just about anything, which is why we look towards the health of the entire watershed and not just the water itself. It can pick up chemicals, compounds, and particles from its surroundings. Uh, we talk about farming as an industry. In more rural areas, in more city, urban places, we talk about things like during the winter, road salts can be a big issue because that actually will make its way into our water. So here are a few pictures of threats. Um, as you can see, there's only six of them on the screen, but there's many more that we will discuss as well. Um, there's sewage overflow and uh, microplastics, as well as just overall plastic pollution, um, the hydroelectric dams, as well as um, impediments to the water flow. So one thing that we'd like to discuss is shoreline development. It, can make your waterfront a little bit more prettier, give you a better view, but it actually takes away from the animals that live in this ecosystem. And so we wanna try and protect it as much as possible, but it will also actually help provide you some protection too. The longer the roots that are in the ground, the, heart, the less the, the area will erode. And so we wanna protect that shoreline for your own well-being, but also it will allow for the animals and any species that live there to have a better ch chance too. Uh, we also talk a lot about industrial pollution, so chemical pollutants and um, alterations to water temperature. A lot of times when you talk about industries, people may get the idea of just dumping things into the river, um, but some industries actually take the water out of the river process it through their plant, and then put it back into the river. This can alter the temperature, but also the water flow. It can really affect the species that are living within it. If the water comes back really, really hot because it was used as a coolant, it can actually affect the fish species that are coming out, um, as well as any other species that are trying to grow in the water. Um, we also talk about nuclear waste too. Unfortunately, the Chalk River facility is, uses the Ottawa River um, it's actually very, very close to it. It's a waste site in our watershed and it can have a big effect on the environment. And we are currently doing our best to work towards seeing that effect be reduced. There's agricultural pollutants um, as well. And we also talk about 
combined sewage overflows. So the city of Ottawa has recently made changes to their um, choices on how they deal with sewage overflow. However, the city of Gatineau still doesn't. Um, so at times when there is heavy rainfall, not only does that wash away everything on the top of the soil and anything that may be on the ground, um, but if the city cannot handle that much water, it will actually allow combined sewage to flow into the Ottawa River. And it makes it so that we can't swim in it, but it also adds more pollutants to the waterway. We're very fortunate that the Ottawa River has such a high flow rate, so it really only affects that one area for maybe 24 hours. However, it's still something that we don't want to see at all. Um, we don't want people endangered when they go swimming in the river. And it certainly doesn't help with the idea that the Ottawa River may not be safe for people to swim in. Uh, the watershed actually has over 50 major dams within it. And this can cause changes to the flow of the water rate. Um, but it will actually also stop species that are migratory from going from swimming within the watershed. Um, some of the species that we'll be talking about later are the sturgeon and the American eel who have migration within their DNA and they get caught in the turbines and when they try to pass through. And so this really affects their populations, um, but it also can affect temperature, water temperature, as well as chemistry, and just um, the behavior of certain species in the watershed. So as you probably know, because you live in, most likely you live in the area, um, we are currently seeing water levels rise in the spring and flooding. Um, and so that combination of natural and human factors can come into play when we think about this. Um, we always want to talk about rainfall and snow melts and seeing how precipitation will affect it, but there are definitely the development of wetlands as well as forest removal and altering certain like ecological zones will affect the flooding rates as well. Um, we want to keep those wetlands as they are because it actually prevents the areas from being flooded. If they get houses built on them, well, they were wet for a reason. So at a certain point, that water is going to make its way back. So now we'll talk a little bit more about the invasive species. Um, so we have and some species that may be at risk as well. Um, I'm sure you all know if you own a boat, why you should be washing it off especially if you're gonna be moving between different types of waterways. We wanna make sure that if there is an invasive species in one area, we're not bringing it to another. We don't need to be affecting more of the watershed as it is. Um, so anytime that there's non-native species that are introduced to our watershed, it can be quite damaging. They may, they may not have proper predators for the area or the conditions may make it so that they take over the like the living space of another um, species. Um, and so one of them that we are currently worried about, which is up here, is the zebra mussel, which you can see living on another type of mussel that it's sewn shut and it's stopping it from being able to eat. Um, they like to cling on to just about everything. We're very fortunate the Ottawa River doesn't seem to be the right habitat for them. And so there are some, but few. Um, they thrive in some other locations nearby though. And so anytime you're taking it from one waterway to the next, you wanna make sure that you're washing off your boat or any of the materials that you may be using. I certainly know that when I was sailing, when I was younger, we used to come here from the Gatineau River and we were not washing our, down our boats. And now I think about myself and go, oh my gosh, what was I doing? Um, but it's just something that needs to be taught and learned and become a general practice of almost instinct. Take your boat out of the water, you hose it down, and it should just be something that happens a little bit more regularly. Um, so we'll talk about the species at risk as well. The picture here is the American eel. So it's something that's really affected by the hydroelectric dams. It's a migratory species that comes in from the ocean actually, and it likes to live in our watershed for about six years, and then it makes its way back out into the ocean. 
Um, but because we have so many hydroelectric dams, they can't actually get through at all. And it's really affecting their species. So their population has declined 99% in the last 40 years. And they used to be a large body mass in the Ottawa River. And now you don't see them very often to the point that most people don't realize that there are eels in the river. A lot of times when I'm talking to different people, they have absolutely no idea that they may be swimming next to one of these. Um, we, the eel is indigenous to this region and to the watershed, and we want to make sure that they stick around. They also have quite a history here when it comes to their relationship with the indigenous population, and um, we want to preserve that part of their culture. We, I can also talk a little bit about the lake sturgeon who lives in connection with the hickory nut mussel. So the lake sturgeon is also a migratory species, so the hydroelectric dams do affect them as well. The hickory nut mussel is affected by that because when they're spawning, the spawn actually attach to the, I believe, the gills of the lake sturgeon, and that's how they travel through the watershed. And so it's a codependent relationship that they both get something out of it. Um, but with both of the populations declining, we can see how one decline may affect the other and vice versa. Um, I'll also just talk about collaboration across the watershed a little bit. I talked about it before at the beginning as well. We do work with both provinces, but we also work with municipalities um, and we try to include as many communities as we can. There's 11 indigenous communities that are within the area that we try to include in conversations, but also take into account just their knowledge of the area overall. Um, we do our best to kind of bridge the gap between all these different levels of government as well as different um, organizations. However, it can be very difficult for collaborative reasons especially when it comes to the provincial level. So the government of Quebec may have a different standing for, let's say, the meal. They may not give it the same endangered listing as the government of Ontario. And because we split the river in half, it's not like the animals really know which side is the right side to swim on. And so it can be quite difficult to really understand how the different provinces may choose to um, assign uh, an endangered um, branding to a certain species. Uh, but overall, we try our best to work with both and all the municipalities in between. Um, we do find that at the local level, you can have a really big impact. And so that's why we try to focus our attention. A lot of times, just getting the public educated about certain issues can be really, really helpful to moving us forward. And then we also deal a lot with public perception. Um, and so 76% of people um, would say that they agree that they avoid swimming in the Ottawa River because they believe it's not clean enough. And 69% will often um, say that they worry about the health of the Ottawa River. And that's something that we want to kind of counter. We believe that the Ottawa River is clean enough to swim in. And we also want people to go out and enjoy it. The more they enjoy the area, the more likely they are to take care of it. And if they create a more sentimental feeling towards it, they might take it with more care when they use it. Um, the Ottawa River is naturally brown. It's because of the tannins. It's not because it's dirty, but a lot of people will take one look at it and automatically assume that it's polluted or something like that. And so we try our best to make sure that the public knows that it's clean to swim in. There are moments, of course, when it's not. However, we want to make sure that the public understands just to take a, take a look at the weather before you go swimming. And really just, it's overall, it's going to be much cleaner than you think. Um, we always tell everyone that after heavy rainfall, you might want to wait a 24 hour period. There's lots of geese on the beaches. And so when it rains, everything washes off onto the, into the water close to the shore. Um, so it is good to wait 24 hours, but um, overall, the Ottawa River, we're very fortunate. It's clean as can be. So I'll talk a little bit now about what we do at Ottawa River Keeper. Um, so as I said before, we are a science-based organization. We do research in community science, 
Um, so you can see some people taking some water samples right there. Um, we also do collaborations um, with researchers from universities and other academic institutions. So we've worked with them on microplastics, eDNA studies, um, and the hickory nut muscle surveys. Uh, we have also co-authored some papers which are on our website and we try to make them accessible to the public so anyone who wants to read it can have access to it as well. Here is a picture of our River, River Watch Network, which we actually depend on volunteers from all over the watershed. We are based in Ottawa, and so we can't always make it all the way to the end of the watershed every year. And so we rely on these amazing volunteers to let us know if they spot anything that's out of the ordinary for their area, if they see any possible pollutants or industries that may be affecting the health of the water. Um, they also tend to lend us their expertise. A lot of them are very interested in science and the health of the environment. And so they try and give us insights. Maybe they're fishermen, maybe they've been fishing in a certain spot for their entire lives. They can actually give us insight into the behavior of the species that are living in those areas and let us know if anything is changing drastically. They often participate in our community-based monitoring and community science initiatives, and they'll collect samples for us which we can actually use to then test for indicators of water health. Um, I think that's the next slide. Yeah, so community-based monitoring. Um, and so we have 14 indicators of watershed health that we try to take a look at. And they tend to be really good examples when we do these tests of how things are going in that region. Uh, we'll test for ice monitoring, so during the winter time. Obviously, we've had a very warm winter, so this year we've been very concerned with ice melting very early on. That can affect how the way that species spawn during the spring. It can affect um, water temperatures and everything like that. Um, the road salt monitoring is something that I've had a bit more of a focus on this year. I've been working with our volunteers quite a bit. They take samples of waters from our local streams and creeks, and we actually test them for chloride levels. And it tends to give us a good idea of how the health of the water Chloride tends to be very present in places where road salts are being overused, and it will actually can be detrimental to the health of any of the water organisms that live in that area. Um, so what happens is road salts will actually melt into the water, and it can be washed away from pretty far as well, which not a lot of people realize um, when it rains or snows heavily and then there's a melt the next day. Um, the road salt will actually melt into the snow and wash away into the sewers and gutters, um, but it can also make its way into the streams and creeks that are nearby that will have an impact on the water organisms. And we tend to tell people to just use less. A lot of people don't realize the correct amount that they should be using on their driveway. Um, it's about one cup for a two-car driveway. And so most of the time you see people dumping big piles of road salt, which is not something that we like to see. I personally like to say that the healthiest way for the environment is to get out your big muscles and smash the ice, but I know that's not the most popular with everyone. Um, there are also other pieces, that, other tools that you can use, like sand and grit. Um, road salts, we find through our testing as actually ineffective after minus seven temperature-wise, because that means that the cement below is minus 10. Um, and so it's no longer effective in melting the ice and it kind of just sits there and does nothing. So if it gets really cold out, you want to use sand or grit and that will create better traction below, but underneath your boots. Um, and it will make it so that you don't dump salt all over your driveway, wasting your money, but also being bad for the environment. So chloride impacts the aquatic life with high amounts of chlorides. Um, entering the creeks and streams. It's toxic and it can interrupt essential biological functions like reproduction, respiration, um, and it really affects the benthic species like invertebrates and, oh God, I always struggle with this real molluscus. Sorry, amphibians Infin and fish also are at risk. Um, when we think about these kinds of areas though, we're not thinking about the Ottawa River, we're thinking about the streams and creeks the Otter River has a really high flow rate, but it's also a large body of water. 
However, streams and creeks, the water tends to sit for a little bit longer and it's also much smaller. So that much more salt is being dissolved into a much smaller body of water. And then we'll see if this video works. I just wanted to show off our amazing volunteers that help us. Our, they are community scientists. Oh, there we go. This is how they take their water samples for us. This year we have about 20 sampling locations across the entire city of Ottawa, but we have a few sampling locations in Gatineau as well. We tend to focus this kind of study in more urban areas rather than rural areas because we found over the years there's quite a big difference when it comes to the toxic levels in urban areas versus the more rural areas, which tend not to have as many issues. So what you saw there was she had a conductivity meter, which is what we use. She took a sample of water and she puts the conductivity meter in it. Through the measurement of conductivity, we are actually able to see a direct correlation between that and the chloride levels in the water. Oh, there we go. And this is just a map of all of our monitoring sites. So as you can see, it stretches all the way up to the top of the watershed. And we're very fortunate to have such amazing volunteers that are willing to do this for us. It allows us to take that data and spend time reviewing it rather than driving all the way up there just to go get a sample. Um, during the summer, we test for a lot of different um, indicator health and so many different compounds within the water. And during the winter, we really focus on road salts. We also have education and outreach opportunities. So like I am here today talking to you, um, we try to educate the public as much as possible. We have a, a team that can go talk to classrooms and schools and really educate students about these kinds of issues. We try to offer our services to teachers and we give resources on our online. We are a completely bilingual organization and so all the services we offer are in French and in English. Um, and all the resources we have online, we try to make it bilingual as well. Um, as you can see here, I believe that is our education intern, Ian, from last summer, and we are at the Nature Museum discussing with kids. Um, at this young of an age, they didn't really care about the rainwater model. They cared more about the dinosaurs that were on it, but um, overall, I think they learned that road salt was bad. <laughs> And then we also have a discovery portal on our website. So if anyone has any questions, they can go to it. It tends to break down some of the bigger issues into bite-sized pieces. So it's easier for people to learn about, but it also means that you don't have to have a science background to understand them. We wanna make sure that this kind of information is accessible to everyone and not just someone who's gotten their degree in environmental science. And then this is how you can get involved. So we have lots of different activities that can do. you can do. One of our main ways is that you can volunteer with us or you can donate, of course, if you don't necessarily have the time. We do shoreline cleanups throughout the summer. Um, you can also download Swim Guide if you like. So during the summertime, we have a science intern that comes in and she travels to a lot of the beaches that are within our watershed taking samples and testing them for E. coli levels. She then takes that data and she uploads it to the website Swim Guide, where you can, anyone can go and check on the water quality of that beach and find out whether or not it's safe for them to swim. Um, we find this an amazing tool. Definitely gives a lot of peace of mind to parents, especially of young ones who want to go swimming all the time. They can kind of get to know the beaches around them and see how the water quality has been all year. There's lots of different things that can affect the water quality of a beach. And so sometimes there's patterns that are developed. Sometimes one beach is very unlucky and the geese just decide that they want to live there for the summer. And of course, they're going to have higher E. coli levels than a beach with less geese on it. Um, and so we'll see oftentimes that maybe one beach is a stay away for the summer kind of deal. Um, but it's no one's fault except for the geese themselves who decide that this is where they want to hang out. Um, you can also see we have a volunteer with us button. You can go onto our website and sign up for our newsletter where we post all of our volunteer opportunities. We also put them on social media as well. Um, coming up this summer, we have a few major fundraising events for us, but we also will be having smaller pieces like shoreline cleanups and outreach booths 
If you want to learn more about Ottawa River Keeper, um, you can also help us out at these booths after learning a bit more about the organization. We love to go talking to the community and trying to get more people aware of these issues. Um, here is the, I'll just talk once, I'll go back one slide. Um, I'll just say that we do have a website called iCleanup. And so you can do your own shoreline cleanup and let us know that it's happened on the website. Uh, we tend to use it to track our own shoreline cleanups, but we also like to see any member of the community that's getting really involved. Uh, we have volunteers that have been using this website for quite a while now, and they've racked up quite a high tally of garbage that they've reduced from the watershed. We do our best to make it accessible to everyone, and so it is in French and in English. All you need is a email address and a password to get started. Uh, we tend to let anyone, we tend to recommend anyone who goes for walks, even if it's just a 30 minute walk, you'll be surprised with how much garbage that you can actually clean up along the way. It's a great way to enjoy the watershed while also helping it. I personally like walking down on the bike paths near the canal or near the Rideau River, there's some too. Um, and you can pick up garbage as you're walking along and make a positive impact. We have a couple of volunteers that actually kayak and they'll pick up garbage that they find along the way, which I personally would tip the boat, but they seem to be getting out pretty dry at the end. Um, and you can use the website to enter that in, letting us know where you picked up the garbage, how much you picked up and what kind of garbage as well. Uh, we always find it interesting to see. Lately, I think bottle caps have to be the number one thing that we see on those um, pieces, but there's also cigarette butts and plastic bags tend to be major polluters. And then lastly, we have a pollution hotline. So you can go onto our website or call the number and you can let us know anytime you see pollution. Every once in a while, we'll get a call that someone saw something really weird in the water and they want to find out what it is, whether or not they need to go home and shower immediately, and maybe if they're in potential danger. So we take this quite seriously and we want to find out about it. Uh, we also monitor things like algae blooms, which can be detrimental to the health of the watershed, um, but can also make it maybe unsafe for people to be swimming near it. And so anytime you see anything out of the ordinary, you can let us know and our scientists will, if you send us a picture too, that's even better because then our scientists can take a look right away and can kind of give you a response as to what it may be. And then I'm done. So thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very, very much, Renee. That was fascinating. I am so thankful that you and the organization are there doing what you're doing. Such critical work. Uh, we had, uh, we're looking at, so we, we do partner, we're looking at partnering more and more. And uh, I mean, I think we had a shoreline cleanup. Uh, well, we did Elmer Island. We partnered with Blue Ocean Cleanup and Riverkeeper. Um, and took people out there. And, uh, but I think we had a, a shoreline cleanup right here at the club as well at one point, not too long ago. I can't remember. Does anybody remember that? Uh, I have all kinds of questions, but I'll ask one from um, John on line first, who asks, how do you, or sorry, do you measure the staff or else levels? Are they published? I'm not sure. You would have to ask one of our scientists. <laughs> Um, I don't uh, directly work with that kind of data, um, but our scientists are pretty dedicated, so it may be one of the 14 indicators that we do monitor. Um, whatever we do collect information-wise, we do try to publish it to the public, and so we actually have a data portal where this can be accessed. Our road salt results are actually up there right now. If you wanted to take a look, we are halfway through the season of road salt monitoring, and so our scientist has now updated all of that information onto the data portal. Great. Concerning road salt, what would you say, and by the way, I read also on your website that you can use coffee grounds on your walkway and very good traction. 
we have lots of them. Um, <laughs> What would you say to somebody who says, oh, I don't use salt, but I use ice melter, which is pet and friendly to pets and lawns? Well, we don't say to not use anything. We haven't done our own research to find out which one is better for the environment. What we want to do is use everything in moderation. I guess that would be the best way of putting it. At the end of the day, road salts are very effective. There's a reason why we use them, especially when it comes to safety during the winter time. We don't want anyone slipping and falling, um, but it's all about using less and knowing when to use it as well. It's really important that you take a look at the weather temperatures, find out if there's gonna be a major weather event. That's how I tell my volunteers to go out and sample the waterways. If you see a storm coming, most people will grab the bucket of salt and they'll dump it on their driveway. Well, that's going to wash off in the day if it's warmer, especially like the weather we had a couple weeks ago. It was melting all day long. So if anyone put out salt in the morning, by the end of the day, that was going to be completely gone. So it's all about using everything in moderation. Sand as well, you know, everyone tells me how messy it is. So that's a problem too. But um, one of the more natural ones I have heard of as that can work is beet juice. I personally have not tried it, so I can't vouch for it, but or how it would look on your driveway. But apparently, beet juice does work. Great. Not sure if I'm ready to try such <laughs> red colored. <laughs> um, back to washing off boats when you move from water body to water body. What if somebody said, I never see anything on my boat? Well, Every, you can really transport just about anything over and just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Especially when it comes to zebra mussels, they're incredibly tiny. So even if you just have a little bit of bad eyesight, you could definitely miss it. Um, it's really important to wash them off one way or another. Overall, we just wanna make sure, it's just a preventative measure to make sure that we're not transporting something invasive from one place to the next. And so whether it's a kayak or a paddle board, or a sailboat or a keel boat, or just one of the little dinghies, it's important to wash it off. Great. I have lots of questions. Surely you must have some <laughs> questions too. Feel free to step over to the mic anytime. And one way to do that is for me to just be quiet and count to 10. I'm curious to know whether your organization has made any links to uh, the local politicians. Do you get any kind of encouragement from them? Uh, are you included in any of their planning? That, that sort of thing. Yeah, so we do actually um, get asked to speak on councils or come in and give testimony when it comes to certain issues. Um, we. On the municipal level, we tend not to have as much of an impact when it comes to legislation. However, we do actually work with a lot of local politicians, just bringing awareness to them about the issues that we are facing in the region. Um, when he was still in the municipal office, Matsu Frahi was a big supporter of ours. Um, we've also done, um, excuse me, we've also done work with different provincial MPPs from the different ridings that we tend to represent within the watershed. Uh, we do work with some of the counties um, further in Quebec and some of the smaller areas too. It can be difficult because it's not always a priority, but also there are certain levels to which they can actually help depending on which branch of government they're in. Um, and so sometimes it will be an issue that can only be dealt with on the federal level or on the provincial level and it's di more difficult for cities and municipalities to make that difference. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> yes. I was just Thank wondering you. what some of your long-term goals are, what the Ottawa River is supposed to look like in 10, 15 years from now, or even 50 years from now. So um, not that certain things already happened and then we have to fix it. Yeah, we 
I think one of our long-term goals is to have the eel ladders put in place. So there actually is a device that hydroelectric dams can install to allow eels to pass by them without getting hit by a turbine. Um, just like it works just like a fish ladder, but it looks a little funnier. Um, the picture that I had earlier of the eel was actually in an eel ladder. It's like a pegboard in a way, um, and they snake their way up and down to the other side. Um, they, not everyone wants to install them because they are very specific to the American eel. Um, yeah, you can see they like snake their way through. Um, but they're very particular species. They don't like fish ladders. They won't use them for whatever reason. They're just unhappy with them, so they need this specifically. Um, but it does tend to work really, really well. And because our watershed has 50 dams in it, it would have such a big impact if it was required for them to have it. Um, we actually tried to do a campaign to get the Carillon Dam to install one. It's the very first dam when you're coming off the St. Lawrence into the Ottawa River. They recently underwent a massive renovation process, and so it was the perfect time for them to install one, and they chose not to, <laughs> which was very disappointing because they are the first impediment to the eels to get into the watershed. And so I would say that's probably one of our long-term goals um, is to get these pieces installed. We know that they will help the population. They have them installed at other hydroelectric dams where they show them using them. They really enjoy them for whatever reason. They like going up and down. So um, we know that it will work and we know that it will help the population levels increase. Um, I'm just wondering if you've reached out to local industries, local uh, stores that produce, that still use plastic bags, and in particular, um, the plastic stickers that go on all the vegetables, and um, those are really bad for for fish and for and when they get into this, the water system. And I'm wondering if if any of those local businesses are have been uh, educated as to the use of some of those uh, plastic. Um, identifying stickers and bags because not all I know a lot of Ottawa stores have done away with plastic bags but you see them everywhere still so I'm just wondering what kind of education has been brought to them yeah so when it comes to plastics we actually um, were able to get funding to do education on stop plastic pollution so stop with three p's um, and we did that in the classroom though so it was one of our education piece funding pieces and so we had to be happening in the high schools um, we haven't done very much when it comes to plastic pollution in the overall, like, Ottawa community. Uh, we do do shoreline cleanups, which tends to bring a lot of awareness to the issue and just how much plastic ends up on the shoreline near the water. Um, however, all of this comes with funding and all of this depends on our capacity to do so. We don't have the biggest staff in the world. And so we try to focus on issues that are perhaps more local and perhaps don't get more attention. So plastic pollution does tend to get more attention globally, um, whereas the American eel is something that's very unique to us. Hi, um, you talked about boaters needing to wash boats when moving from one body of water to the other. Are there other practical things that um, you know, that boaters could do or not do that would really impact the quality of the water? Well, number one, don't throw plastic off your boat, please. <laughs> um, I certainly remember when I was a sailor and we would have to eat lunch out on a, rega a regatta day and you were eating lunch out on the water, those little sandwich plastic bags, you know, they fly away in the wind and that's not what we want to see. Um, so definitely just try and be aware when you are eating or maybe using wrappers or anything like that. Store them securely in a bigger container that's weighed down so it's not flying off the boat when you're not noticing. Another big one is to make sure that you're not going to have any gas leaks. So you want to make sure that all your equipment is revved and ready to go, um, but that your motor is in good condition so it's not leaking, that your gas tank is clean on the outside. When you're filling your gas tank up, you want to make sure that you're doing it away from the water um, so it's not getting into the water uh, there. When, if you see garbage out on the water, you can always pick it up. No one's stopping you from doing that, um, and it'll definitely make an impact. Um, 
Yeah, I would have to say those are the bigger ones. We don't want to discourage people from enjoying the waterway. So that's not at all what we're trying to do. We're just trying to conserve it for even longer. We want to make sure that when you go to use the water, it's in the best condition that it can be. So you can have the best time without worrying about any of the issues. So just related to that, uh, there's discussion right now on the board of directors about an initiative of our harbor master to possibly procure bilge socks for all the boats at NSC, which absorb everything but water. Because a lot of the time, our automatic bilge pumps come on because if there's water in there, and then everything gets pumped into the harbor, and that's not good. So if we can work at only pumping water out and nothing else, that's what we want to strive for. I have a question on the same topic from John Rekos. A lot of boaters use anti-fouling chemicals such as VC-17. It is copper-based and washes off during the season, which is how it works. Do you think this should be discouraged? I'm not educated on that subject, so I can't answer you truthfully. Um, I don't even know if we have that kind of information on our website. We tend to cater to more general questions than those specific boating questions. But what I will say is that we are certainly not the only ones doing studies on water quality or on the effects that humans may be having on water quality. And so I'm sure the answer is out there. I actually looked into that. Um, there is an environmentally friendly bottom paint you can get, but I don't believe it's available in Canada, only in the States right now something to look into. And actually, along those lines, um, I didn't mention I, I've joined the board as PR director in January. And one thing that I would love to do is if any of you here or at home or you know, or can pass the word along, I would love to have somebody working with me who could be a kind of liaison to Riverkeeper, to Blue Ocean, and uh, just keep us informed of what's going on and be a little bit of a stronger voice uh, at Nepean Sailing Club for these initiatives and these organizations. Any other questions? Um, I just think, I mean, it was amazing seeing the, the size and the, uh, of the whole river shed. It's pretty inspiring. Um, but you mentioned Chalk River. I'm also thinking about the logging uh, business that was going on industry for and paper mills and that kind of thing. And I just wonder historically where we are in the cleanup of that, um, those historical bits and pieces that made a mess of the river. <laughs> yeah, so I personally can tell you that the logging, logging industry that happened on the Gatineau River still has an effect to this day drive around the boat and you try and avoid deadheads and hope that nothing's gonna pop up from under you as you're driving around. Um, it's a unique issue that I don't think a lot of people deal with. And it was super normal to me to just be like constantly worried that a giant tree was gonna come and hit my boat while I was driving. Um, overall, we tend, I don't think we have like that much information on previous industries. Our, biggest realization right now is that there isn't actually that much data from the area that goes back a very long time. And that's why we've decided to focus on the 14 indicators of watershed health. It actually gives us parameters for when we are collecting this kind of data that we can set a baseline of where we were when we first started until where we are now. And hopefully that will help researchers in 10, 20, 30 years from now to get a better idea of how the health of the watershed is. We know that there are certain industries that have a bigger impact. Right now, the Mint is trying to dig out any of the scraps that they threw in the, wind, the river like years and years ago. Um, and so we obviously know that those industries were created big challenges for the ecosystems here. Um, but not all of it was actually recorded. And so it's really difficult for us to tell what the baseline was before they started um, th that kind of work. Hi, um, I noticed on your, on I think it was your collaboration slide that you had listed Environment and Climate Change Canada and Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And I wonder if you could speak briefly about 
your involvement in like public consultations or the utility of the, the data gathering that you use and how it can be used for advocacy and legislative changes? Yeah, so we try to collaborate across many different types of organizations. Um, we also have a lot of our staff will actually come in and out of gover different government um, branches. And so we've had volunteers in the past that have used to work for fisheries and they've come to us with the same interests. We've had staff that go on to work with the environment, but in, maybe in a more federal branch. Um, we, we also get funding from different government branches, um, federal level, but also for different studies as well. We try to help educate them on things that we may know a bit more about or may have studied for longer. And they actually take us in and help us out a little bit too. Um, this year, two of our scientists actually went to go see the eel ladders um, that were working at one of the hydroelectric dams just outside of the watershed. And so they got to see how they monitor their populations, put trackers into the eels. Uh, they got to hold them, um, which they're very slimy, so I can't say that I would want to do that, but it was very cool for them, and they were so excited to tell us about it afterwards. Um, we want to work in collaboration. Obviously, like Fisheries Canada is going to have a much bigger budget, much bigger impact, and much more access than we will to a lot of these places. And so wherever we can use that data and contribute and maybe add to it, we try to. Is there an area of the whole watershed that's of more of a concern than others, or is it mainly the, the river that everything flows into? Just depends on what indicator you're looking at. The urban areas, we're gonna see a higher density of population and we're gonna have a bigger impact in certain places. Um, in the more rural areas, you're gonna see possibly runoff having more of an impact when it comes to fertilizers that's being used, which will cause algae blooms like crazy um, or other industries that may be not be seen in urban areas, but they'll be further out there. And so that's why we look at all 14 indicators because the watershed is so vast, it covers many different types of areas, well, of population areas. And so you have the more urban ones where high density population the homeless population may have a bigger impact like they do in Hull, um, but we have a major impact when it comes to road salts. And then you get to more rural areas where the farming industries are gonna have a larger impact on the water quality. So it's, it's a difficult answer. I know that wasn't really an answer, but. Difficult question. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? I have none more from home going once. Going twice. All right, well, Renee, we wanna thank you very, very much for coming and for informing and educating us on what you do and how we can think about being more involved as well. And I hope that we will be. I've really valued our partnerships in the, um, the um, fish derby that was recently here that we hosted here in the harbor and, um, and other things over, over time. I hope to see much more happening. Yes, one of our volunteers actually caught, I think it was a 32 inch pike when we were at the ice fishing derby. So wow. that was pretty, you can go online to see the picture. He was so proud of himself. <laughs> That's awesome. So there were about a, at least 150, if not more out here on the ice fishing. And then we had some 65 come in for, for a buffet. So it was a really fun day. Yeah. So. We wanted to give you as a thank you, um, uh, a, it's a discount code for our online regalia store. And uh, we'll give you uh, your choice, a discount of anything that you, you choose to purchase. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, if you haven't seen it already, we do have an online regalia store. You can just search for regalia on our website if you don't have a, a QR code reader. Uh, I'd like to say thank you again tonight for donating to the Legacy Fund. We are now up to almost $800. Tonight is night 6 of 12, our halfway mark. Our goal is 2000 so we'll keep working on that.
And uh, don't forget, next week we've got uh, Dan Godbu coming to talk on cruising down the St. Lawrence River. Thank you so much for coming. Have a good evening. <laughs>